Hey everyone, my name is Dave. Welcome to the NTD Racing Speed Shop. This is where I do most of my welding here on my fabrication table. And I do a lot of TIG welding. And my buddy Bear, who's on our desert racing team, he's been MIG welding. He wanted to up his game to a little bit of TIG welding. And so I told him I'd make him a video that shows him everything he needs to know. Now realize, I am not professionally trained. I didn't go to school for TIG welding. I've been doing it for about 20, maybe 25 years or something like that. And what I usually do is I build desert race trucks and I spend a lot of time building one truck named Honcho, which is a 1978 Jeep J10, and another truck named Lefty, which is looks kind of like a Ford Raptor, I guess, underneath the fiberglass and those kinds of things. And I build all kinds of things and I do a lot of TIG welding. So what I'm gonna talk about today are the things that you're gonna need if you're gonna wanna TIG weld, how I set everything up, whether it's the machine or sharpening a tungsten, the material to a TIG weld, and then what it looks like when we're all done. Let's go ahead and get to it. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the welders I have, and it gives you a good idea of the different options for TIG welding. This is a MIG and a TIG welder. That is a mixture of argon and CO2, and you can MIG weld with CO2 or the mixture, but with TIG welding, you need argon for that. So let's talk about the different options that you have when you're purchasing a TIG welder. This one right here is a Miller Dynasty 200, and it is a dedicated TIG welder. And so let's look at some of the things that it does. It, it does connect up to my 230. It takes the argon. The argon gas goes into the TIG welder. As it goes through there, it has some valves and it turns the gas on and turns it off. That gas comes out through here and goes into the lead that goes to my torch. And then whenever I push the gas or whenever I push the, the TIG welding pedal, then it starts the electricity and it also starts the flow of gas through the line to the, the torch and it's all pretty much automated in that way. Now that is different than the Vulcan OmniPro 220 and then also the Best Arc welder that I just practiced TIG welding on a couple of videos ago. That welder was $125. The OmniPro 220 is around $1,000. And then the Miller Dynasty, those are probably, I don't know if they're even selling anymore, $2,500, $3,000 welder so the price goes up the more automated the difference between this welder right here is that the gas does not go through the machine when you are tig welding it does in this case for mig welding but not for tig welding and that is why when you have that kind of machine that's why you would have a valve that is on your tig welder because you would have to manually turn the gas on or turn it off in this case though the Vulcan OmniPro does have the ability to also have a pedal to control the amperage from the welder. If you check out the review I just did of the Best Arc, which was like a $125 MIG welder, I was able to TIG weld with it also. But the difference between that is that as opposed to being able to start the TIG weld with the, uh, the pedal, it had what was just called a lift arc where you would basically take the tungsten, you would touch it to the piece of metal and say, okay, I'm ready to go. And as soon as you lifted it, it would strike the arc and it would start going. Now they are all kind of a lift arc. You know, this one, you touch it and you press the pedal down and lift it and it starts the arc. Same with this one. It's just that the best arc, you couldn't control the amperage with a pedal. And the pedal is key when it comes to doing like a a lot of TIG welding those kinds of things with that there's some other things you need to consider you need to have a nice helmet spend a couple bucks on a good helmet uh, it, I have a Miller and I've had it for a long time it's key to have a nice clear visor I use readers also to make sure I can see the puddle if you can't see it you can't weld it a good pair of TIG welding gloves, something that you can maneuver the consumables through your finger really well. When I'm talking about consumables, uh, in MIG welding, the, you know, the wire comes through the gun. In TIG welding, you've actually got to feed the wire in. And so you need something that you can manipulate and push the wire through your fingers into the, uh, the puddle. We'll talk about a little bit more about that as we get into uh, the TIG welding. And a good pair of gloves. I get these from uh, the Weldmonger store. Uh, that's Jody from Welding Tips and Tricks. Super smart guy. Really generous with his, his time. Sometimes I also will use these, especially if I'm welding some thicker stuff, maybe quarter inch because it gets hotter. And I can weld pretty good, I think, with these thicker, usually probably MIG welding gloves. So they're, But they are uh, pretty nice. And then you need to get some torch parts. Let's go ahead and look at the torch. All right, I think by looking at the torch you, and maybe me taking it apart, you'll have a better idea of what's going on inside the torch. And this is the part that, that holds the tungsten. So you have this hose right here inside the hose 
is where the argon comes through and then also the, the electricity that's going to kind of come through and create this arc and all the heat and so that'll be the argon going through there so in this case this is a ck17 this is my favorite uh tig welding torch the head is flexible in that like uh for this example if you're welding something you want to kind of flex the head to give yourself a better angle on the weld then it can do that this one also has the valve you can turn the gas on and off and really that's only used if you don't have like a, the valve the uh, gas control in the welder like i have it in my miller but i don't have it in my other two welders and then just some of the parts that are in here this part here is called the back cap the back cap can be short like this one right here which is nice again when you're trying to get into tight spaces but if you have a long tungsten uh, then you're going to need to have a longer back cap uh, and when usually when you buy tungstens they come about six inches long uh, and so you need to kind of have a longer one of these now what the cap back cap does is it puts pressure on this thing right here which is called the collet and the collet wedges down inside there as you screw in that back cap and it closes down on the tungsten so this is actually the thing that is holding the tungsten and transmitting all of the electricity from the basically all the wires that are in there all that all those bits and it transmits it into the uh, the tungsten so there is the uh, the tungsten and we'll show you how to sharpen that here in a second the rest of it is just how it gets the gas so this right here is called the cup it comes in different sizes you can screw this one off there's some that are clear and you put like another uh just basically a gasket in there and push that thing on and then inside here is what's called a gas lens this is what i like to use i won't use anything else but a, a gas lens when i'm tig welding that thing screws out of there you can get replacements from these pretty easily on the amazon stores where i get mine and then just a little cap here that makes the seal and that's how all that stuff uh, goes together so before we do start welding we need to make sure our tungsten is sharp let me go ahead and show you how i sharpen my tungstens all right this is where i'm sure i'm going to get some comments about how i sharpen my tungstens this is just the way i like to do it and i've tried just about everything and you find that you know stuff like this about 90 percent of the people watching the video are like this is great information i never heard of this before and then there's this 10 percent who are probably professional welders and they're going to tell me how to do it right and i will say that that is what the comments are for so if you find better information or if you know something better you know put it in the comments read the comments there because there's some really great information that people who are just really generous with their profession that they'll add there in the comments and i do appreciate it i, I read them all all right so a couple different things happen on the tungstens here this one right here if you can kind of see it i probably hit the metal and it melted and put this big Big blob on the tungsten and this one over here it probably just got really hot and I lost my tips so that's two different cases and I'll sharpen these two different ways when I go to my uh, to my sharpener so this is what I use um, I again in the links in the description below I use this DeWalt 12 volt drill I love this thing probably one of my favorite drills I usually use mostly 20 volt stuff but this 12 volt one I think it fits perfectly in your hands I really like the way that it feels so I will chuck my tungsten in my drill and I'll get it on fast mode so it spins really fast. And then I will turn on my uh, belt sander. And what I will do is if it is just a tungsten where I've just lost the tip, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and let the belt sander run while I'm spinning the drill. And I'm gonna basically let the belt sand in this direction, not this direction and i'm going to cut basically what looks like the end of a pencil the same slopes and all those kinds of things as the end of a pencil you can go less and more and i just haven't found much difference again for me personally doing that way the end of a pencil seems to work pretty well if i'm doing this one where i got this uh, nasty tip on there what i will do is i will run it up against the corner of this sander i will cut everything off that has any metal that's not tungsten completely off and then i'll spin back over to here and i'll put that sharp edge on there and then once i'm done i'm gonna go ahead and take a scotch bright pad i'm gonna hold it in my hand spin it in my spin the drill and i'm gonna clean everything off the end of the tungsten once and then i'm done with that i'll go ahead and i'll go from the bucky's pile over here to the bob ross pile and i'm ready to go back to tig welding let me show you how that's all done
Okay, so let's talk quickly about surface preparation. If you're gonna MIG weld or something like that, you can kind of, I think you can get away with a dirtier piece of metal to weld uh, onto, but TIG welding's different. It needs to be bright, shiny metal. I used to get that from uh, Jody from Welding Tips and Tricks. Uh, you, there's a couple different options. You can use a flap disc and take it off, but I find that the flap disc really takes a long time of working on it to get rid of the mill scale. So what I use is two, one of two techniques is one, is I will use a vinegar bath and then I, you can just basically wash off the mill scale. And I have a couple videos, I'll put a link in the description for that and how I use vinegar to remove mill scale. Or you can use what they call a surface conditioning tool, this one by Clutch. I did a big review on this, really like this tool. And uh, let me show you just how nicely this thing works. I chuck this thing up my magnetic vise and then hit it. And you'll see it takes the mill scale off pretty quick. So that's pretty good. You can see how quickly it takes it down to just shiny metal. I will still probably hit this with the belt sander before I uh, start welding it. And the last thing I'll do is I'll use a little bit of acetone to wipe this thing down to get all of the oils off of the metal. All right, so before you start TIG welding, again, cleanliness is everything when it comes to TIG welding. I'll use a little uh, towel and some acetone to make sure I wipe everything down, all the surfaces that I'll be welding on. And then I also will wipe down my consumable, my metal rod here. Uh, to get all of the oils off of that. Let's talk about assembling the torch with the tungsten. I slide the tungsten into the uh, the gas lens. You wanna make sure the back cap is loosened. And then how far do you let this thing stick out? They usually say no more than the width of the opening that you, you have. I say as far as you can put it in and still do the weld is probably better because realize what you're trying to do is maintain that shielding gas over there without having any gaps. If you let this tungsten stick out too far, you're gonna lose your shielding gas and you'll, you'll notice that the, the weld is just not consistent while you're doing that. And then it's how tight you go, just tight enough to hold that tungsten in place. If you go too tight, you're gonna squash that, that call it down. It's not gonna last quite as long. Okay, we're ready to turn the machine on. What do we set it to? Well, I take the piece of steel that I'm going to weld and I measure it with my micrometer. And then I take the thousandths of an inch. In this case, this thing is 0.129 inches or 129 thousandths. 129 mils, whatever you want to call it. I will set that as a starting point in the amps once I turn on the machine. Uh, and just in my experience as welding with this 1 8 inch plate still, I usually use about 140, so I turn it up just a little bit more than what that thing says. But that gives you a good starting point. Let's talk about the argon. So argon is expensive and it'll last you a long time as long as you remember when you're done to turn the valve off and then also to try to set the argon every time you go to weld. So what I'll do is I'll open up the bottle, I'll pedal down to get the flow start going and then I will turn the dial to get it up to about 10 CFM for, the, for welding. Now you'll find is as the welding bottle gets empty, it will flow higher and higher CFM. So you gotta continually turn that down as you start getting closer to an empty bottle. All right, so we're set up when we're finally ready to weld. Now you can use a magnet to put on your pieces of metal to hold them in place while you're welding. But I find for some reason that by using a magnet to hold the stuff in place before I tack it, that magnetic field pulls my puddle all over the place and it really messes up the weld. So if, if I can help it, I will try not to use a magnet to set up my weld. And in this case, what I will do is I'm gonna bring the torch in and I'm gonna just try to put it in the corner. I'm gonna go full throttle and see if I can't just make a small little tack weld to the metal and hold those things together in place. In, in my experience, the smaller the tack weld that you put on there, the better. So first let's put a tack weld on and then we'll talk about what the weld's gonna look like. All right, so we got a nice little tack uh, weld on there. So some things to think about while we're welding and what you're gonna see me doing is uh, as far as the how I'm gonna hold the torch, you can hold it like a pencil, you can hold it like this, whatever it is that make it, makes it comfortable. You basically wanna set up your piece of metal or set up whatever you're welding, run your hand through what you're gonna weld so you can kinda make sure that you're not gonna get snagged on anything or caught up while you're making this weld. And then also give you a chance to figure out how you're gonna hold the welder. 
as far as the weld goes, you, you got the, the lightning coming out of the tip of this, this thing and it aims it pretty well. And you want to basically aim it into the area that you want to weld. If you got a flat area here and you got an edge on one, so one piece is a flat area, one is an edge, maybe you'll add, aim it slightly more on the flat side because it'll tend to melt the edges pretty, uh, pretty bad. And then, so I, I aim it in there as mo much as I can and I will tilt it slightly in the direction I'm gonna travel and you kind of push a TIG weld along. And then as far as the consumable, basically what you wanna do is you wanna get yourself into a rhythm. So to start this thing, what I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna to touch the tungsten to the metal I wanna weld. I'm gonna push down the pedal and then I'm going to lift it and it's going to start the arc. I want to keep that tungsten about one eighth of an inch away from the thing that I'm welding. I want to wait for it to build up a pull on both sides of these pieces of metal. Once I see that both sides are, are, are starting a pull of metal, then I'm going to feed in a little bit of, of the uh, consumable. I'm going to retract the consumable. I'm going to move the TIG welder and then I'm going to feed in a little bit more. And I'm going to retract it, move the the TIG welder and move it down a little bit more. And I'm gonna do that as I go across the, uh, the piece of metal. And that's what's gonna make that stack of dimes. So let's go ahead and see if we can't demonstrate the, uh, the stack of dimes while I do it. All right, so let me do the best I can to talk about what I'm doing while I'm doing it. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the tip of that tungsten and I'm gonna to touch it to the metal. I'm going to push down the pedal to get the flow of argon going, and I want that to purge everything out. So give it a second or two to purge it out. And then I'm going to lift it, and it's going to start to melt the metal. I'm going to go full pedal. And the first technique I'll show you is that I'm just going to hold the full pedal, and I'm going to move and dab, move and dab, move and dab with the tungsten and the torch across the piece. That is one technique. The other technique would be where I throttle the pedal. So I'm going to lift the pedal, I'm gonna throttle down, build a puddle, dab in with my consumable, lift the pedal. I'm gonna move it, and then I'm gonna go back down on the throttle, on the pedal, dab it again, lift, move, throttle down, dab, with the consumable, lift, move. And that helps me slow everything down if you do the pedaling, especially when you're doing like round two or roll cages. It makes it really easy to stop, reposition your hands or something like that without having to stop the arc. If you're just doing something like that, you just kind of keep the throttle down and keep going. There you go. That's it. I was going a little bit slow since I was talking about it, but you can kind of see what that weld looks like. That's a pretty good weld uh, on there. So, you know, how long can you go with the tungsten? So, as far as the tungsten goes, as you're going across there, I find that as long as the weld is staying out in front of the tungsten, so you're well, you got the torch here, but it's melting the material out in front of the tungsten. And that's, that's probably telling you that your tungsten is doing pretty good. But if you accidentally dab it into the material, you'll see your arc change color. Um, I usually see it kind of go to like a greenish color in my helmet. Uh, and then also you will lose control of it. So while you're trying to get it to melt the metal out in front of you out there, you'll actually see it melting the metal behind the, uh, the tungsten. And that's just your indicator that you've done something wrong to your tungsten. It's no longer sharp. Maybe you got some contamination on the end. That's time to take it out and replace it with a different one or go back and sharpen it. Now I do love the results from TIG welding. That was pretty good. I wouldn't say it's a perfect stack of dimes, but I was talking while I was welding, so I'll give myself a little bit of a pass. I do know that will hold. I put welds like that on our race trucks and they, I've never had a TIG weld felt. I've had MIG, MIG welds fall apart because you can never really tell if the fusion is happening, but there's no doubt in your mind when you're doing a TIG weld, if the fusion is working. So uh, I did talk a lot about things that I use today, tools and those kinds of things. And the links for those are in the description below in case you wanted to purchase some of those. And then I also talked about a bunch of videos. I've made a, I think I'm on, this is video like 301. And I've done a lot about welding and plasma cutting, and all those kinds of things. And you'll find the ones I talked about today also in the description uh, below. Hope you learned something. And if you're one of those folks who is a professional at this and you've got a better way or technique that you have, I am all ears because I'm a student of the craft and I'm sure that there are other people that are watching this that would benefit from your comments and we do appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Please consider subscribing if you got something out of this, leaving a like, that definitely helps us out and we appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. Take care of yourself.